How did this all come together, Brian? Well, they the Pelicans wanted to get a deal done in advance of the draft. Now, sometimes I get a little skeptical when teams create deadlines that aren't real. You know, um, Daryl Morey of the Rockets is famous for this, uh, creating deadlines to try to force uh, deals. But I do think that they wanted to have some time to sit with that number four pick, either to use it or to, to, to trade it off. And when the Knicks sort of fell out of the bidding and it became clear that it was going to be the Lakers pick um, or a deal with the Celtics, um, really was a bidding war between those two teams. And Rich Paul was concerned, his agent, Anthony Davis' his agent, was concerned about the bidding war between the Lakers and the Celtics as far back as last fall. And he was concerned that the Celtics would win that bidding war because they have players that the Pelicans um, uh, prefer. And so he entered into a multi-stage, multi-month effort to get the Celtics to, to not be able to do a deal with the Pelicans and force them to the Lakers. And at the end of the day, I, I do believe that's what happened. Uh, the, the Celtics just couldn't risk what it would take on a player who might leave after a year. And I don't think that the Pelicans really liked the player assets that the that, um, Lakers had. They clearly didn't like it in February when they rejected the deal. And I, to be clear, Rich, I don't think it's that they don't like Lonzo Ball and Brandon Ingram. I just don't think they liked that as the major piece of the trade. Um, so they took what they could get from the Lakers, which was basically draft assets for the next five to seven years, and went to the to the wall in terms of that to make up for the fact that they're not in love with the players that they're getting, and that's really the way this trade went down. All right, so let me ask you your your now. Let's get to it. Your two cents on the trade? Do you, you don't like it? And it it sounds like you were particularly virulent in your dislike, Brian. Well, no, to be clear, um, I, uh, if you can get a superstar player, it's a, it's a major accomplishment. I always say that there's two types of teams in the NBA, teams that have superstars and, and teams that wake up dreaming of ways to get them. So for the Lakers to go to land two superstars in two years is tremendous. Uh, it is exactly what you try to do as a front office is, is layer your stars. That's what builds championship contenders. My point in the night of the trade of the draft, or the, I'm sorry, the night of the trade, which you just played some there was people were just shrugging off what the, uh, what the Pelicans uh, acquired. Um, the, if you had to really look into the details of what was in that, to understand exactly what was in that. It wasn't just, oh, three first-round picks, let's move on. It was three first-round picks and a swap and a deferment that will give the um, the Pelicans control of the Lakers draft much like the way the Nets controlled the Celtics draft for five years. I'm sorry, the Celtics controlled the Nets draft picks for five years. Now, you can come back on me on that and say, well, Paul Pierce and Kevin uh, Garnett were not Anthony Davis in his prime, totally fair. Um, that's absolutely true, uh, but I just I just didn't want people to glaze over that you know what was in that in that trade. It was one of the steepest prices in terms of draft picks ever given out. Well, I mean, and, and so um, my my response to all that would be for the Lakers, they are in the they're in the LeBron James business right now, and either they're gonna you know win with him in their final three win you know years of his window. Or even maybe somehow re-sign him and he finishes his career here with Anthony Davis. So what would the draft choices really even mean for them? That's my... Well, again, that's what, that's what people would say. That's what people said about the Nets. <laughs> the other thing is that people, you know, again, this is what people don't compute. Because of the, the trading rules, the Lakers can now not trade any future first-round picks to help them stock the team. Um, you can't trade picks in back-to-back years. So now with, with all of their picks, the word that they use in NBA circles is encumbered. They can't trade any draft picks. So, like, if, if you need to get LeBron and Anthony Davis help, you no longer can use even those, even like you couldn't trade your 2024 first-round pick for any help. And um, I think that was just something to be pointed out. But what you're bringing up is what I think is the real issue. It's not issue, but the, re- the reality which is that people keep saying, well, who won the trade, the Lakers or the Pelicans? And the answer is LeBron won the trade because LeBron is a guy who, um, you know, wants to win today, right now. Give me a player right now. If you go look at his, uh, this is about to be his 17th year, he's only played with about maybe three or four rookie first-round draft picks. 
Yeah. All of his teams have always traded their picks um, because it's always win now, win now, win now. Um, what he's got here basically is a redux of 2010 in Miami and 2014 in in, um, in uh, Cleveland, where he now has a top-loaded roster with a couple of stars that doesn't really have role players yet and is going to require him to do a lot of heavy lifting in terms of shot creation and ball control and everything like that. Uh, we don't know that their roster is yet, so we don't completely know what it's going to be like, but the Lakers are going to have a, a year here where they're probably not going to be at their most depth and best because of the way this went down, and that's a reality that LeBron has been comfortable with shouldering the load in the past. It's just that in the past he was, you know, eight and, and five years younger, and, and that's a, a question mark to me. For more of the Rich Eisen Show, tune to Audience Channel 239 on DirecTV for free on BR Live or download the Rich Eisen Show app.